Hi, good evening, everybody. We are back live for our third market commentary. And uh, this is where we talk about the latest developments in the market, share our thoughts about what's happening, and uh, you know, really discuss it out here. So um, I am Albert, the Deputy Country Manager in Stashery Malaysia here, and I'll be your host for this session. Um, we are joined, as usual, by Stephanie, who is the Co-Chief Investment Officer here. Um, since this is live, uh, as a live event, if you have any questions um, on what we talk about or even relating to Stash Away, uh, please do feel free to post those questions uh, in the Q&A box and we will get to it afterwards. Um, yeah, how, how are you, Steph? Uh, it's been a wild week. Um, I'm sure many of you uh, who have been following the news uh, may have heard about you know, what had happened to the you know, crypto exchange FTX. So it's um, in addition to, to that and other events, it's been a very, very eventful week. Um, how, how are you, Steph? No, I guess, I mean, we're like, uh, we're experiencing very, very high market volatility in various aspects. Mm -hmm. uh, crypto, particularly, of course, is a very, very volatile asset as well. And interestingly, for, I guess, the past two, three months, crypto um, uh, vol has been actually really low. So nothing much happening. And I think there was one point where crypto volatility is actually lower than S&P. And when you have these like, kind of volatility compression, that means that a lot of energy is actually stored in the asset class, and when it kind of explodes either to the upside to the downside, a significant move would be uh, would be following. So I think we're seeing part of that, and also of course uh, uh, there's like um, events that are happening at centralized exchanges like FTX, and also contagion effects on other exchanges as well. So uh, I think events will continue to unfold. So expect the market to be quite volatile. Mm -hmm. um, but also, I mean, crypto is one asset class, so we have which is. I guess sizable, but not a like, kind of systemic. We have a bigger asset class, which is just, like the bonds, which are much more volatile uh, this year. If you look at kind of the, the longer history, so I guess yeah, there's a lot to talk about. And uh, where should we start, Albert? Um, well, I guess speaking about market volatility, one of the key events that happened a couple of weeks back is you know the 20th National Congress in China, which is pretty unprecedented because that's where we saw Xi Jinping essentially secured his third term as the head of the Communist Party. What he did was he essentially consolidated power with among the top lieutenants with him um, at the highest um, political or decision-making body in, in China called the Polit Politburo um, Standing Committee. And markets didn't really take that very well um, because as you know, from that event itself, we saw I think the, the day after it, uh, markets opened down 6%, they felt that this was really a, a tightening of Xi Jinping's power on the you know, on the country itself. Mm. So, um, what what are your thoughts? What does this mean? Um, not only from I guess a, a, a politics standpoint, but also from an economic growth for China going forward. Yeah, I mean, of course, like the China political system is a very opaque and and I guess sometimes like quite complicated system. Uh, from the looks of it, I think, I mean, what Albert, you have described is correct is in the sense that, I mean, there's six kind of the highest uh, level party members appointed to the Politburo, uh, which sits like directly under uh, President Xi. And among these kind of uh, six uh, members, a few of them are newly appointed and they are Xi's uh, protégé and or close allies. And I think what also kind of uh, shows a tighter grip is also that for the first time, I think there's a security, uh, uh, basically the uh, Minister of State Security is appointed to this highest level of uh, authority and power. So I think market reacted uh, by uh, basically selling off afterwards, but also uh, apart from the political concerns, I think it's worth kind of looking at a broader picture and, and look at how market perform actually into uh, leading up to the Politburo or, or the um, or, or the meeting. Uh, markets actually rally into it. And, and, and I think uh, there's a lot of expectation on actually uh, China announcing an easing of COVID uh, restriction policies. Uh, unfortunately, or I guess I, I, the, the, the basically uh, the market was disappointed by the lack of uh, very concrete announcements. I mean, there were some rumors and I mean, the market basically gyrated according to uh, what the latest rumor on COVID uh, reopening would be. So of course, uh, I actually sit in Hong Kong and uh, Hong Kong is also affected by, I mean, what uh, the Chinese COVID policy would be like. Uh, and I guess um, just, Looking, uh, 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 speaking from the experience of Hong Kong reopening, uh, Hong Kong is now 
kind of, I would say, partially reopened for business. So, for example, travel policies are, restri- uh, are less restrictive than a few months ago. But still, I mean, compared to a lot of the other economies in the world, uh, there's still a, lo- a ways to go uh, on reopening. And it's taken actually Hong Kong quite some time. Uh, and, and Hong Kong has taken a very, very gradual approach. Uh, and if you want to be kind of more objective about it, there's actually uh, indexes uh, that tracks kind of the um, uh, the openness of uh, e- economies according to COVID. Uh, and I guess uh, if you rank it from zero to 100, zero meaning like very, very open, 100 meaning very, very tight. China now sits at around kind of 60. Hong Kong is about I guess, 40, 50. US is actually about 20. So there's still some ways to go. And I think the concern about COVID reopening is because uh, China's economy is not doing well. So if you look at China PMI, for example, it's been in contraction for a number of months, like for the better half of, of this year. And without a COVID reopening, it's very, very hard to see China's uh, economy rebounding significantly. As investors, when you invest in China or other kind of growing economies, of course, you're looking for earnings growth, you're looking for economic growth. And when a economy uh, such as China is not growing, when the company is actually not growing the revenues or profits, as a foreign investor, there's no, I guess, no good reason for you to get involved in that market. I think that's why the market is basically very much hoping that China will announce the uh, reopening policy. From a seasonal point of view, I guess it's not just from an experience, but also from seasonal seasonal point of view, we're entering winter. And we've actually, if you track like COVID cases in China, it's uh, it's ticking up uh, 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 with the with the winter season uh, as well. So I guess our base case expectation is that you will see a gradual relaxation, but that probably happens over kind of a longer period than Marco was looking for. And also probably uh, we'll have to wait after the, uh, the passing of the winter season. Hmm. Well, seems like uh, you know China has its own issues to sort out, but I guess switching gears a little bit to, to the US itself, um, we, in the last one week, we have had multiple economic developments coming out of there. Um, the, I guess the biggest one being the rate hike decision last week where the Fed decided to increase interest rates by about 75 basis points. And uh, this you know, brings up the, the benchmark rate to about 3.75 to 4%. And this was kind of within expectations of the market. Um, but what the market was more interested in was his commentary on the day itself. Um, they didn't really take it very well. Um, initially, it was okay um, upon the decision to hike rates. But when Powell came out to speak, uh, markets took it very negatively. So would you be able to share, Steph, a bit more about you know, why markets didn't like what he said. Yeah, I mean, markets initially uh, rallied after the statement was released because uh, people were looking for signs of a pivot, like a pivot meaning, oh, the Fed is actually going to stop tightening its, its policy or at least see a plateauing of the rate hike and possibly reverse course. I think there are expectations building uh, leading into the FOMC announcement because we've seen a few pivots from other central banks. For example, uh, the Bank of Canada, uh, actually hiked uh, less than people expected. Uh, and then also ECB uh, hiked 75 basis points, but in a communication, they were trying to be like, quite dovish. Uh, so there were some expectations that, oh, maybe there will be a pivot for the Fed as well. And if you look at the Fed statement, actually um, the, 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 the part that got uh, investors excited was basically saying, oh, our next hike is going to be 50 basis points instead of 75. So it seems like gradually, I mean, the, the Fed is actually stepping off uh, from, the, from the guest paddle. Uh, however, I mean, I'm sure Powell was looking at the market as well. And when Powell actually went into the press conference, he didn't like what he see. He didn't like the market actually rallying. And he basically became the ho- most hawkish uh, person in the room. And immediately in the first question and answer, uh, he, he said, actually, uh, hiking 50 basis point next um, should not be the focus. The focus should be our terminal rate, like where we're going to eventually take interest rates to. And his uh, his point of view and also what the market is now expecting is that the Fed will actually take interest rates uh, above 5% and probably uh, remain at above 5% for some time until they're very, very confident that they've, uh, they've actually um, uh, killed the inflation beast. And also, I think if, uh, if, if you look at kind of how Powell has communicated, he's referred to Volcker a few times. 
And for like students of history, you remember that Volcker was a person uh, that was in charge of the Fed in the 1970s. And his mission was actually like solely to focus on bringing inflation down. And he hiked uh, interest rates like, very, very aggressively at the expense of the economy. So uh, what Powell hinted at was basically that he thinks if he needs to be more aggressive uh, in terms of rate hikes or like staying at 5% for longer in order to bring down inflation, he would do so and he would be willing to do so at the expense of bringing down the economy. Because what he thinks is that if we bring down the economy, if I slow down growth, uh, it's an easier problem for the Fed to fix. Mm -hmm. And in his mind, it's more difficult. It's a big, bigger risk if they don't get inflation down and inflation uh, expectations continue to rise. So I think that sends a very, very hawkish message to, to the markets, um, particularly uh, uh, given also, I mean, the uh, the data still is very, very strong. Of, of course, tonight we're going to get the CPI data uh, in, a, in, in about an hour's time, so uh, or two hours time, given that we've changed the uh, the time zone. But uh, that would be very, very interesting to watch because uh, if you look at some of the leading indicators of inflation and also given the tightening, uh, we expect inflation to actually start to peak and come off. Uh, but given, I guess, the 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 the, the message that Powell has, has said, basically he will take inflation up to 5%, uh, despite a inflation uh, coming off. Uh, so unless inflation comes down very, very quickly, I think the, the Fed will actually stick to their path. Hmm. So, um, we, well, the Fed has two, essentially two mandates, right? Price stability and um, employment. Um, like you mentioned, we will have uh, the CPI numbers out tonight. So that's something to keep watch uh, for. And uh, on the other end, in terms of employment, we last week we had non-farm payrolls coming out. Uh, essentially, mm -hmm. the jobs numbers came out better than expected. And um, on the back of it too, we saw unemployment rate in the US, um, it rose from 35 to 3.7%. So on the back of this data, in addition to news that we're hearing from different companies out there like um, you know, Meta, Intel, Microsoft, or even Twitter, right? You know, Elon Musk cutting half of the uh, employees there. Um, and then hiring we, back one third, right? <laughs> I think. And supposedly hiring back some, not all of them. Um, you know, we, we're, we're seeing this kind of backdrop of increasing layoffs uh, happening. Yes. So is it, do, do we get the sense that we are entering a recession uh, with all this being announced? Right. Yeah, I think, I mean, we've seen a lot of news flow on companies cutting um, staff. Now, of course, like, th these are like unfortunate events for like for, for the for the staff that got cut. But also, if you think about the fake communication, I mean, that was what they intended to do. That is kind of how they plan to get inflation down. Basically, because uh, wage inflation is um, is a very, very big component of uh, inflation and also wage inflation drives other inflation as well. Right? If you get paid more, you can pay more for your cars, for for food, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, I mean, the Fed's like very very blunt tool is to actually uh, slow down the economy, such that I mean companies will have to cut staff, and such that I mean they'll slow down inflation as well. But I guess if, as an investor, if you put on like um, a, a a kind of contrarian hat, uh, companies actually cutting uh, staff means that. Uh, I guess the the profitability of the company actually improves, right? Especially for tech companies, because uh, we for for a very very long time, given a very easy money, uh, companies don't have to make profits, right? Mm -hmm. They just need to show revenue. However, in a new regime where the uh, where where the liquidity is not so easy, I think what the what the market is telling you is that as as a company uh, CEO, you need to watch your profits. You need to show cash flow. You need to show profits in order for investors to have confidence. I think that's what we're seeing in a lot of tech companies, given that actually payroll is a, a the biggest cost item for, for these companies. So I think as an investor, if you put on a contrarian hat, it may not be a bad thing that, to see that these companies cutting uh, cutting staff because they're, they're paying a lot more attention to profits. And ultimately, um, uh, as I mean, you... A, a company is value in profits and cash flow. So, I mean, it's uh, it, it, it's something uh, that we continue. And I think it's, um, it, as an investor, you can get kind of more, more comfort in that uh, companies are taking steps. Mm. Great, great. And um, well, we, I, I mentioned earlier that 
or you mentioned earlier that one of the, the data is, is coming out tonight, the CPI, but uh, another thing that's happening concurrently too in the US itself is also the US midterm elections. So that is, uh, or at least um, that's a process that has started at the, the start of the week and it's taking some time. Um, overall results right now is show, show, it's pointing towards a poor display for Republicans because there was an expectation for them to you know, have an overwhelming uh, win. But the early results show that, okay, Republicans are, seem to be winning the House and we have the Senate where it's kind of 50-50 either between the Democrats and Republicans. So this is important because it, you know, has an, it has implications into how policies will be made and subsequent impacts on the global economy. So um, any early thoughts on this step? I know this, you know, we, we, are, we don't have any, uh, any hard concrete results yet, but anything that you can share? Yeah, I think uh, the I, I think the market's uh, worst uh, the worst outcome for markets is that Democrats actually take both the Senate and the House. Uh, the reason for that is because I mean people worry about uh, un, kind of unchecked spending, uh, and which would of course like push up the government U.S. government's debt, and therefore I mean push up uh, uh, interest rates and government yields are even higher. Uh, so I mean that worst case scenario is now. Uh, very very low probability, and I think what I, I, if you look at kind of the early results, as Albert you said, um, it seems like the Democrats are going to retain the Senate, uh, and the uh, Republicans is going to take the House. So I think it's actually not a bad outcome in the sense that oh, there will be like checks and balances, and it's not all Republicans taking uh, the, the the both the House and Senate either, because it also has implication. I think the the broader implication is like in two thousand twenty four. Uh, who will win the presidency? Uh, it seems like it's the the the, the candidates would be uh, Biden from Democrats. I mean, Biden has already said he'll run, uh, and uh, Trump, of course, said he'll run for Republicans as well. So, uh, I think the 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 more split um, outcome seems to suggest that uh, it's it's not uh, it's not certain that I mean Republicans will have a very significant lead, and particularly Trump will have a very significant lead. Uh, over the Democrats or over other Republican uh, candidates uh, when it comes to the 2024 presidency. Mm -hmm. Okay, so well, I think those those are the topics that I wanted to cover for the U.S. We talked about um, the rate hike decision last week. We talked about uh, jobs data. We talked about companies um, you know, laying off people. And the two things to watch out for is uh, CPI, CPI data tonight uh, and also the results of the U.S. midterm elections. Um, I want to jump into questions uh, because we have, have uh, we have a question here uh, from a listener and um, he's asking you know, how will the gradually gradual opening reopening of China or Hong Kong affect the markets going forward? Will mm. it be able to regain ground uh, as fast as you know, before? I think um, uh... I think obviously, I mean, reopening is going to be good for uh, the economy and business. Uh, and one one major reason, I mean, why China has been lagging behind in terms of uh, returns and also just the economy is because I mean, people can't travel, and the policy is very unpredictable as well. Because today, uh, today, I guess uh, you you don't know what's going to happen uh, if you go to China. You don't go know what's going to happen to restrictions tomorrow. So it's very very hard for businesses to to conduct. On a regular basis, uh, as far as like kind of is the reopening going to uh, really accelerate uh, China's growth? I think it's def it's a cyclical kind of uh, a cyclical help. However, there are some structural issues that I think China still needs to address. For example, uh, we've seen a big crackdown on some of the biggest sectors in China over the past two years, right? The property sector makes up 30% of the GDP. Uh, the internet sector was, of course, contributing to a significant amount of growth in China in the past uh, few years. And both of these uh, sectors actually had, had a very, very significant uh, kind of, uh, uh, I guess, uh, a crackdown and also uh, pushback in terms of growth. So with these two sectors kind of, um, uh, I guess, suffering, we need to see where China would place it, its bet in terms of like the next driver of growth. Do we actually see growth back in the, the into technology again? And if so, and which parts of technology and is it going to move the needle for China? So these are questions that I think 
uh, would still need to be answered uh, af- even after like COVID reopening. Uh, so, but I, I mean, I do think that if you look at China, it is, uh, I mean, the the top or the top two economies in the world, not the top uh, in terms of GDP. So it, 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 it is definitely a very, very uh, important economy to, to monitor and also to look at, look for investment opportunities uh, given its weight. So this is a economy that I guess if you're an investor, you I cannot ignore. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll continue to monitor the developments there. Wise words, yeah. Um, China being a, an economy that you can't ignore. Um, I got, uh, there's a last question here. Um, I guess it kind of circles back to what we talked about at the beginning, which is about volatility, right? So, you know, how, how do we as, a, as customers or, or investors on Stashway's platform manage volatility going forward? Um, because we've seen so many things happening and, you know, sometimes data is good, data is bad, markets take it differently. How should one position their portfolio accordingly? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, because actually when we designed the Stashway products, uh, we had risk uh, as kind of our primary uh, driver for how we design our portfolios. And that's why uh, when we think about our how our customers would invest, we think in terms of the drawdowns the potential drawdowns that a customer will experience. And also, does that drawdown actually match with our customer's risk profile? And if you look at our uh, our core portfolios, they have the statutory risk index, which is a 99% value at risk, which means that over a 12-month period, uh, what is the expected uh, uh, kind of like drawdown in a uh, very, very bad case scenario? Now, of course, this year is a very, very bad case scenario because uh, of the bond uh, volatility, which you haven't seen in 30 years. But I think uh, it gives uh, us a, a sense of if you are, let's say, I mean, more risk averse uh, to the extent that you can only take, let's say, I mean, 10 to 12 percent of drawdowns. Then I mean there are like certain portfolios that you should not be involved in, right? For example, a thirty-six percent drawdown portfolio would not be a good portfolio for for that particular investor. So I think it's important to keep that in mind. Um, and then secondly, of course, is to try to um, I guess maintain a balanced portfolio uh, of of asset classes um, that all that all generate kind of long-term returns, but may have different kind of path of return over like, like, in a short period of time. Therefore, they can kind of balance out each other. And then I think lastly is um, if if you are uh, investing and I mean, markets go through ups and downs, right? And like, it's very, very hard to time the bottom of a bear market. However, uh, if you have a habit of doing DCA, which is dollar cost averaging, over time, I mean, you would make a better return than, I mean, just timing the market. Uh, so I think, I mean, there's a few tools, that, like these are a few tools that you can use to uh, to mitigate the risk and the volatility in this bear market. I guess kind of summarizing it up, then the, the three key things are maintaining a diversified portfolio, understanding your risks, and you know, if you are investing for the long-term DCA, uh, because it's hard to time your entries and exits. So um, great. Yeah. So that's, that's it really for uh, this session. And uh, well, thank you so much, Stephanie, for your time. Uh, Thank you to all our listeners here uh, for listening in, tuning in. Um, If you have further questions uh, based on what we just discussed or Stashway, Mm -hmm. do feel free to reach out to us. Uh, We are available at support at Stashway. And uh, I hope you all have a good evening and uh, please do take care. Subscribe to our YouTube channel to get notified whenever we have new content out for you. Also, don't forget to download the StashAway app. It's available in the Apple App Store as well as the Google Play Store. So you can start on your financial journey right now.